back when I was a full-time tech editor at Cycle World during the early 80s and lurking in the roomy but windowless office now occupied by editor Edwards, I had a small quote from a British bike magazine taped to my door. It read, Ducatis are like cigarettes. You may quit for a while, but you always come back to them in the long run. This little gem of wisdom struck a chord with me because both addictions seemed related in some strange way. I was then trying, with only limited success, to quit smoking and had several times ceremoniously thrown my last pack of camels, a fine blend of domestic and Turkish tobaccos, into the trash, only to have the urge for a nicotine hit return at the least opportune time. Usually while I was working alone in the office over the weekend, I'd be sitting there typing my deathless prose about rejecting a Honda 400 Hawk with mid-range stumbles when, suddenly, a red message would light up in my brain saying, you must have a cigarette. And I couldn't concentrate until I did. Well, I've long since stopped smoking quit cold turkey on my 50th birthday, but the instinctive urge to own a Ducati has remained as persistent as that old cigarette habit used to be. I've owned nine of Borgo Panigale's finest over the past 28 years, and the occasional gap in ownership has always set off a motorcycle variant of that same red message light, you must have another Ducati. The problem goes back quite a few years. While I admired the small Ducati singles that hit our shores in the 60s, even if they weren't triumphs, the first stirrings of genuine desire came with the arrival of the exquisite round K750 SSV twins. These were expensive, however, and seemed virtually unobtainable, as any Ducati dealer lucky enough to get one simply kept it. They were always on display in showroom windows, but I never saw one on the street. It was the Square Case 900 SS, built in much larger numbers, that finally made the sleek Desmo twins available to mere mortals. And it was here that the real addiction took hold. It started about the first week I worked for Cycle World, early in 1980, when I arrived in California from Wisconsin just in time for the Los Angeles Motorcycle Show. A bunch of us rode up there from the office, and when we walked through the doors of the main pavilion, the first thing we encountered was a black and gold 900 SS rotating on a raised round platform under the lights. It looked like a wedding cake with a black widow perched on top. Except the Ducati was better looking than any deadly arachnid. Equally dangerous, but much better looking. It had gold wheels, an anodized chain and bodywork in ebony black with discreet gold trim to stir the anglophilia of those of us who misspent our youths lasting after Vincent's. Velo sets and Edge 7 RS. But this was no dusty old British classic. This was the most potent production track weapon of the moment, its immediate antecedents having recently won, in variously tweaked forms, both the Isle of Man and the Daytona Superbike race. And the bike was cleaning up everywhere in production club racing. Spartan, purposeful and uncluttered. While the other CW guys wandered off, I stood there transfixed by the beauty and rightness of the design, sort of like Wayne, or was it Garth? Staring at that white Stratocaster in the window of the music shop. Anticipating that movie by a couple of decades, I said aloud, oh yes, it shall be mine. As luck would have it, a few weeks later I won a $5,000 editorial prize from CBS Magazines, which then owned Cycle World, for a story I'd written about my triumph Bonneville. It was clearly a case of mistaken identity or some bizarre corporate foul up, but I wasn't about to ask any questions. The check arrived at 11.45 on a Friday morning, and at noon I ran down the block to champion Kawasaki Ducati and bought a used 1978 900SS from shop owner Lee Fleming. When I signed over the check, the money I had been in my hands for exactly 15 minutes. This bike was a runner. It had been Lee's personal street bike, and he was then the 8th Mopen production class champ on his racing 900SS. The compression was up slightly and Jerry Branch had reworked the cylinder heads. I remember my own first ride as being somewhat disorienting. Compared with, say, a Honda CB750F or Suzuki GS1000 of the day, the Ducati was slightly harsh and uncomfortable, with a severe shortage of steering lock. 
your feet were tucked up behind you in a full racing crouch, and the exhaust note sounded like Muhammad Ali working a speed bag with forceful, rhythmic deliberation. You looked down at the engine and wondered if it had enough aluminum around the cylinder bores to contain all that violence. Getting off my Honda 750 and climbing onto the Ducati was like leaving the Hilton and entering a Trappist monastery, a dark place lighted by torches where you slept on a stone floor.